my name's Dan. I'm the uh, biochar facility manager here for Living Web Farms. Um, this, uh, this is our crew over here, Johnny and Evan. Um, in our free time, we get to do things like um, experiment with solar and get into some more fun, appropriate tech projects. And those are the kind of workshops that we're leading now. So who here, have you guys done any solar? You got solar electric systems? on your farm, house, or house. That's great. Uh, sustainable living uh, healing center up in Canada. Okay, wonderful, yeah. Um, who here was at Richard's uh, solar hot water class earlier this summer? Back away? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's the last thing. <laughs> okay, yeah, I imagine a little bit of what we talk about is probably gonna dovetail with what he was talking about earlier this summer. Um, so obviously there's a whole lot to talk about in a really short amount of time, especially with the late start. Um, but um, what I want to do for you guys at least is to be able to show you um, how to go shopping for these systems. If you're committed to building one on your own, I'll at least get you started um, designing a system. Obviously in an hour and a half's time, we're not going to be able to cover everything that it takes to design a safe and effective PV system, but I can at least get you familiar with concepts so that when uh, you're getting quotes from installers or something like that, at least you'll know where you're coming from and you'll be able to compare that um, effectively. Um, you know, a couple of things that we're not going to talk about is um, grid interconnected systems. Um, that means we're using like the power lines as a source of energy as well. Our, we're talking solely about standalone, small systems out in the field for remote power. Um, so that means uh, almost exclusively the solar panel itself, most likely a battery and some sort of load that you're going to try to run off the battery. Um, so we'll get into all those details here in a little bit. Um, we're not going to talk about any kind of systems that involve like a generator assist or any kind of other power source besides solar. Um, those systems are easily accomplished, but again, there's too much hardware to talk about. And uh, most likely, if you're getting into something like that, you're going to be looking to an electrician to, to get some help. So I come um, to Live in Web Farms after working in solar for almost eight years. Um, I can say that about half of that time was in installation of PV systems. Um, most of the time we're going out and doing, um, you know, somebody wants their home powered by solar. It's a five kilowatt system on their roof and it might cost $20,000 up front to get power and they'll get payback in seven or eight years or something. Um, rarely did we get the chance to do these little standalone systems, um, but uh, that's something that I've been real excited about looking into since I got here. Um, we started by building this generator um, as a means of controlling something out in the field. We didn't know what it was that we wanted to control, but we knew that we wanted to play around with little uh, microcontrollers or PLC or some sort of like thermostat controlled equipment out in the field. Might not necessarily need to run a power line out to that. And heaven forbid we didn't want to like run a 5K portable generator all the time so that we can power our like one milliamp load. Um, so that's how we got started looking into solar. And then this project, like everything else we do, kind of got out of proportion and we decided, okay, we want a generator, something that actually doubles as a generator so that we can use it for uh, running power tools or we could use it for irrigation. We could use it um, for heat lamps. Say we wanted to run a heat lamp for a couple of nights. Um, that's something we can do. Used it last week to keep the electric fence going during a lightning storm. Um, we wanted something that met expectations of a generator, but then also could just work standby and just power these really small loads where it didn't make sense to be going out and refilling a power generator with gasoline every day, you know. So that's how we came up with this uh, mobile solar trailer design. And this has all the components. Everything that I'm gonna talk about tonight is right over here. So do you, can you all get a good look at this? Maybe we can pull it forward a little bit. 
Okay, so you guys understand the difference between solar electric and solar hot water panels? Mm -hmm. We all familiar with that? Okay. Um, so PV is what we're talking about here. That means photovoltaic. That's just electricity generated from sunlight. Um, that means when sunlight hits this panel, it starts generating power, um, instantaneously generating power. And our goal as designers is to be able to build a system that um, takes that sunlight and is sized according to the load that we're going to run off of it, and then has a battery that's also uh, in place so that we can um, power our load when the sun isn't shining. So that's the stuff that we're going to cover today. Um, the advantages of PV are pretty obvious. First off, I think as farmers, homesteaders, I think you'll appreciate that it's almost no maintenance required here. Very little maintenance. No moving parts. You know, they're the same solar panels that they put on the satellites like 50 some odd years ago are still there, still producing power. Um, you know, I can't speak to the maintenance. I imagine the maintenance costs are still pretty high for those. Uh, quiet, no moving parts. Again, we're not having a 5KW generator out roaring out in the field. Um, uh, one thing that's not so obvious is its modular design. Um, we can add on to this system. We can add one more panel to this system, and we can add as many batteries as we can feasibly fit on this trailer. That's not something you can say about a lot of power generating technologies. This is, uh, with a little bit of planning ahead of time, um, you can invest a little bit up front, and then you can slowly add to a system as time goes by, as you can afford it, um, as it makes sense. You can pull components off, you can replace them. Uh, PV systems just by nature are really modular. Um, that also requires you as an operator and an installer certainly to uh, understand how each component works with each other. You don't look at your fridge and have to understand it, you know, but this system you at least need to know a little bit about how it operates um, in order to operate it. Obviously it's uh, decentralized power. You're not connected to the grid independent, you're in control of it, and um, environmentally friendly. You're not adding fuel to it, there's no exhaust, none of that. Um, so some of the challenges, um, we all know that um, solar, wind, you know, on a massive scale is, uh, you know, the main reason why we're not doing that, well, for one, is cost, but also because there's no great way to store energy on a utility scale. That's a really tough problem and that's really essential um, to understanding how these systems work. Um, a, a way that I like to think of it is instead of thinking about um, running your load directly off the panel, think about running it off the battery and then the panel is just the charger for the battery. You know, that's um, a little bit easier to think of it that way. There's certainly some circumstances where you can plug a panel directly into a load, but um, you're up to some really extreme variables in terms of like when the shade comes, your motor's gonna die down. When it gets really sunny, your motor's gonna ramp up, and um, a lot of you probably already know that motors don't like to be tweaked like that, and they certainly don't like to get a lot less power than what they're supposed to get. Um, upfront cost, um, you know, I wanna emphasize that that's upfront cost. Um, once the system's paid for, it's paid for. You can't say that about a lot of other equipment. Let's think about what if we're going to run this out by uh, way down in the corner of the farm. Rocco's got his hogs. You know, Rocco needed a heat lamp the other day. Um, what, are we going to run a power line all the way down there? If we do, I'm pretty sure that we're already looking at the cost of covering this. You know, and this is something, a heat lamp is something he may need a one week every year. I don't, I don't really know but maybe it's a couple weeks out of the year he wants to run a heat lamp. Well, you're looking at the cost of either running the power line all the way from the barn down to the pig pen, or you're just looking at this thing that you can drag out there, pull it back, you know, when you're done with it. It's uh, really, that's how we get to justify it for a really concrete cost. Of course, there's all these, uh, you know, you can justify it as, you know, emergency preparedness. You can say, you know, if environmental stewardship is your game, then you know there's a lot of different ways that you can uh, confront the uh, upfront cost of this thing. 
Um, you guys want to know how much that cost us? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do. That's about $1,300. Yeah. Um, half of that cost is in the batteries. Of course, we built it. You know, so you know, the trailer, I want to say we maybe got 150 in parts on the trailer. Maybe a little more than that. Um, I got most of this stuff, I, and you know, I should watch my tongue. I don't want to necessarily endorse anybody, but I did get a lot of this stuff on Amazon as a, as a kit. Um, those modules are about a dollar a watt, and that's actually a pretty reasonable price right now. If anybody was doing this 10 years ago, it's $4 a watt would be pretty reasonable. You think I'm right there? Yeah, and they're 100 watt panels, right? Yeah, yeah, four 100 watt panels. And the charge controller is pretty reasonable. Some of this stuff is salvaged. Those boxes are salvaged. You know, it's the little electrical components that really add up. The stuff outside of the main components. Um, this thing actually tracks the sun. I'm proud of that. It's a uh, timer based, but it's still, it'll turn 15 degrees every hour and track the sun throughout the day. I think um, since in some of the paperwork that some of you guys might have, um, that adds about 40% to our generating capacity throughout the day, just tracking the line. And that's powered by a windshield wiper motor from the uh, junkyard as well. So if you guys don't know about windshield wiper motors, it's like, that's, that's gold for us. <laughs> 40 RPMs, high torque, 12 volts, it's perfect. I think probably the hardest part about getting people into solar is, um, it's the, the thinking that goes involved. It's not necessarily thinking about buying a system or how to design it. It's just that constant feeling that you need to pay attention to what you're doing. Um, and I think as farmers and homesteaders, you guys are probably used to that already. You know, thinking about how much time you got and doing the work that's the most important. Um, well, think the same way when you're doing this. Let's like, it's, you know, again, it's important not to leave the lights on. It's important not to run your pump any more than you need to. Um, efficiency is, a, well, I've read that a dollar spent on efficiency is four dollars spent on solar. So efficiency isn't just about insulating your house or turning the lights off. It's about knowing when to use your appliances and, uh, and taking advantage of that. Um, You'll see the cost will come way down when you start looking at, okay, when I, you know, I want to irrigate one hour a day versus I want to just irrigate four hours a day and not have to think about it. I'll show you. What we're going to do is look at this system and um, look at a little 12 volt DC pump that we have and we're going to say we want to run this pump for four hours a day. What does that take and how much does that cost? Um, hopefully we'll get enough time to do all that. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about siting solar. You guys are familiar with the path of the sun across the sky, right? Mm -hmm. You know, in the summertime it's way overhead, in the wintertime it's way low. Okay, in the wintertime it's shorter because you're starting s south of east and you're setting south of west, right? So sh shallow arc versus taller arc. And at where we are, north of the tropics, that sun never gets directly overhead. It's always going to be south, even at noon on, on summer solstice. So, in effect, we point our panels south. Because if we can point them south, then we know that the sun's always going to be hitting them. Maybe not the most direct, but at least they're hitting them. So that's the most important thing when siding your system is south, 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 south. Um, Think about um, as the sun is high in the sky, perpendicular to the modules, it's going to be coming down. Um, that's why we have adjustable back legs on ours. If you guys are going to set a site, then go out there and think about if you can move your panels seasonally at least twice a year. Adds a lot, right? So what we can do is, is come out and customize whatever angle we want. You know, we're pretty close to solstice still, so we've got this thing bottomed out all the way down to 20 degrees. 20 degrees is because here in Asheville, at our latitude, 20 degrees is about the highest that the sun gets in the sky. Well, 
20 degrees perpendicular to the modules, right? Okay, at 36 degrees, we're going to be um, roughly perpendicular to the sun. If we were to set this at 36 degrees, we'd be perpendicular to the sun on the equinox, right? If we set this to 50 degrees, then we're perpendicular to the sun in the wintertime. So you see the pattern there? Latitude is equinox, 15 degrees one way or another. Shallow for summertime, steep for wintertime. Um, throughout the day, not quite as important. You know, if you're 10 degrees off on south, not that big of a deal. You're maybe talking about, you know, with a fixed array, you're maybe talking, I don't know, 5% loss or something if you're off. So most importantly, get it facing south, fix it at latitude if um, year-round production is what you want. If for some reason you need to prioritize wintertime production, fix it at 50 degrees or somewhere in between. A lot of solar hot water heating systems are going to be fixed at a wintertime angle because they want to maximize wintertime gain and want to minimize summertime gain. Um, you know, don't underestimate any of these environmental factors where you're placing this. If it's uh, sun or water vapor or dirt or leaves falling on it, you know, this stuff does add up quite a bit. Um, that would be your maintenance would be coming out and making sure that these things are clean. So get it up high, you know, get it where if you've got livestock, they're not going to be nibbling on the wires on the back of it or anything like that. Um, you know, think about that kind of stuff. Think about, you know, if you're going out and sighting this in the wintertime, think about what leaves are going to come up. Think about your fast growing trees. Um, you know, easy mistake to make would be go, oh, I've got good sunny property right here. And then, and then forget that you've got that little cedar tree over there. Or you've got a, you know, big oak tree that's going to set its leaves again here in, in April. Um, there's a lot of information on that last page in the handout on uh, siting. And if you want to get really detailed about it, um, there's a method that you can use um, for almost little cost, like almost no cost, using a uh, compass and a protractor. And you can actually look at a solar chart, which there's a link to a solar chart in the last page for Asheville, which says like, okay, the sun's going to be at this angle at 9 a.m. on winter solstice. Okay, so I'm going to look at 9 a.m on winter solstice and I'm going to set my protractor with a little plumb bob on it and I'm going to use my protractor as a sight and then I'm going to look off and say okay that's my angle what do I see at that site and I see a tree okay move it you know two hours later 11 o'clock sun's at 30 degrees or whatever it is you know then you make a mark that's all outlined in the last page um, I wouldn't necessarily say that you have to do that if you're doing a really small system like this um, certainly, if you're going to put something on your house, if you want to power your whole house with solar, then yeah, you need to do some upfront work and make sure that you got a really solid site. Rule of thumb is we're looking for minimum six hours of sunlight on the panels. That's the nine to three rule, right? If you've got sunlight between nine to three, then you're in a good spot. Any questions on siding? Can you use water to rinse it off? How do yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure somebody would sell you something, you know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> use water. Yeah. OK, let's look back at our system again. And I'm going to start introducing some uh, electrical concepts, if you guys aren't familiar. 100 watt panels. Do you guys know what a watt is? Everybody knows what a watt is? Anybody doesn't, don't be embarrassed. Okay, you guys know what a volt and amp are? You know that volts times amps is a watt? Yeah. Great, wonderful. Um, these are 100 watt panels. They're about 18 volts and they're a little over five amps at maximum output, okay? We got 400 watt panels, so we've got a 400 watt solar array, okay? We've got, um, a 220 amp hour battery. Do you guys know what an amp hour is? Amp hour, just in case, that's a, you know, fairly esoteric in my opinion. Um, it's a way that we rate batteries in terms of their capacity. 
Um, that means it can deliver so many amps over so many hours. So we've got a 220 amp hour battery. We can deliver one amp at 12 volts for 220 hours. I'll show you in a little bit why that's not true. Um, we've got a 40 amp charge controller. We've got all these fancy boxes. We've got my little microcontroller that does uh, mainly it's, it's driving the uh, tracking system. Um, we've got some other fuses. Um, we've got a low voltage disconnect in this second box. We do. I've got a little cheap um, Northern Tool um, inverter on the back of it. 750 watt inverter. Now I could probably go much bigger than that, but again, that's just something that I had. And we're still kind of flushing this thing out to see where it spends most of its time. And that's where we're going to spend most of our money on. You know, if we need to run AC equipment for long periods of time, then we'll invest in a solid inverter. Right now, we're going to try to just prioritize DC loads. You have a charge indicator on it? I'm trying to come up with Yeah, that comes on the charge controller. It comes on the charge controller? Yeah. Yeah, I've got Renogy is the company that I went with, um, mainly on price. I just wanted to get something that was pretty affordable. Um, these guys, most of their applications are on RVs and uh, like camper vans and that kind of thing. So I got the Renogy 40 amp uh, charge controller. Um, has all kinds of displays on it. It'll tell you what, um, you know, how much sunlight instantaneously you're getting, capacity of the battery. Um, how much power you're pulling off, but only off of the charge controller. It won't tell you what you're pulling off the battery. You guys that are looking at solar, what do you want to do? Can I ask? Pumps. pumps. What kind of pumps? Okay, 12 volt pump. Needs about five to 10 gallons a minute of head. I'm going to, oh yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's not, yeah about 25 to 30 uh, feet of head. Do you guys know what feet of head is? Okay, that's the lift of water to overcoming friction. Is it more efficient to run straight, straight 12 volt or to run to a converter and do the one point? What do you think? I would think anything that's going to drain power is going to be less efficient. So running that converter is going to take more. Exactly. Is there yeah. a percentage? Is there any kind of percentage? I think you get about a 10% drop. 10%. Yeah. And you know, my little cheap inverter, I'm sure it's more than 10%. You can tell because those inverters have big fins as heat sinks. So that heat's coming from somewhere. Um, this is our little 12 volt pump that we got at the junkyard. Um, this came off of some sort of paving equipment or something that was dropped off over there. So we're pretty excited to see it. Um, we're gonna set it up possibly as a sprayer pump. That's what I'd like to do. Spray compost tea, um, you know, inoculate our biochar, all that kind of fun stuff. But um, we looked at this and we sized our system according to running this pump for three days. If we wanted to run it for three eight hour days, not full days, but three eight hour days. Um, so we've got a 3.2 gallon a minute, 45 PSI, you know, so quite a bit, you know, a decent, decent head on that. Um, this is a 12 volt pump. It's about um, five amps. So what I'm going to do for all of our examples is I'm going to use that pump as our example. You know, I've got 12 volt pump that takes five amps. That's a 60 watt pump, right? Now remember, I've got a 400 watt solar system. We need to run it four hours a day. So, let's say we want to run it four hours a day. I know I just said eight, but let's pretend like we're only gonna run it for four. That requires 240 watt hours, right? So you guys are all familiar with kilowatt hours because you pay your monthly electric bill, but you know, we're, we're all the way down to watt hours. We're talking jump change. Um, let's say we had, you know, that's easy. That's easy. We're going to turn that pump on four hours a day. We're going to cut it off. Um, let's imagine we had something like one of these greenhouse fans over here that we wanted to run, but they're controlled by temperature or humidity. 
you know, we're going to leave it on all the time, but we don't necessarily know when it's going to be on and when it's going to be off. You know, that's up to Mother Nature um, or where we set the dial. So that's certainly something to think about. You got to think about what type of load you're running. Um, you need to know how much power it takes, how often it's going to run, and if there's any controls in that equation outside of you turning it off and on, right? So thermostat controlled is one. Power tools, that's intermittent use. You know, I can plug a drill into this thing, but I'm not going to sit there and hold the trigger for four hours. You know, I, what I need is a system that can deliver enough power to, to run that tool, but I don't necessarily need to run that tool all day or think about running it all day, right? Another example of something we wanted to be able to do, and um, you know, this is entirely dependent on the need for it, would be to run a block heater or something in one of our tractors. Now that's a huge electric load. That's talking 1,000 watts or 1,200 watts. A huge electric load that you're gonna run for about an hour, you know, maybe a little bit more. Let's pretend it's 1,000 watts for an hour. That takes one kilowatt hour to run a block heater, right? That's 10 cents or, you know, 12 cents. <laughs> but um, let's pretend we had a 1,000 um, watt block heater that we wanted to run for one hour. And um, let's take that and divide that by 12. Who can do 1,000 divided by 12? What is it? 83, wow, great. 83 amps. Assuming we got a 12 volt block heater. We've got a, do you remember how big that battery is? What I said earlier? 220, 220 amp hours, right? So if that battery is 100% charged and we pull 83 amps off of it, um, it's uh, what about two thirds charged after you know assuming we go over there and remember to turn that thing off <laughs> you know let's not uh you know let's not run that thing for too long um there is definitely an issue with pulling too much current off a battery at once what i have over there i'll get into this a little bit later are um agm batteries they're actually a little bit more tolerant in terms of quick charge quick discharge so um, moving back on to our 5 amp, 12 volt, little teeny 240 watt hour demand. Um, let's keep that in mind as we move on here. Um, solar panel, PV module, solar electric, you know, whatever you want to call it. I'll probably call it module from here on. Um, Quality ranges quite a bit. There's, uh, you know, in the marketplace, there's probably three main types of solar panels that you can buy. Um, mono crystalline is going to be your most expensive, most efficient option. Um, polycrystalline is going to be your second in line there. Um, in my opinion, that's the most bang for your buck, unless you have a very limited amount of space. So say you want to power your whole house, you know, and you've got a small roof, then maybe mono is the way to go. You're talking about pretty small gains in terms of the difference between mono and poly. That all has to do with the manufacturing process. Um, mono panels, if you're curious, are the ones that look like this, right? You've all seen those? Blue over a black frame or over on a white surface usually. Um, at least that's how the really old ones look. Um, those are wafer thin pieces of silicone crystal that's grown. And then there's two wafer thin pieces that are, are alternately doped is what they call it in the industry with boron and phosphorus, I believe. Do you guys remember phosphorus? phosphorus yeah. yeah. Okay, so what that does is generate a small electrical imbalance in between the two. One of those has a positive charge, one of them has a negative charge, nature reports it back in. So when sunlight is on there, it, it excites those electrons, and what you're doing is building a circuit between the positive and the negative side of these modules, right? Okay, so these are wafer-thin pieces of silicone crystal. These panels, you, can, you can't really see them the way it's turned here. 
Can everybody see that? A little more? Monocrystalline panels. No doubt those are price competitive with um, polycrystalline, or I wouldn't have bought them. Um, polycrystalline panels are the ones that look like full sheets, right? And, and generally they're going to be a little bit darker. And polycrystalline is, is kind of the leftovers of this process. Um, put um, together, fused together somehow, so that the cells are going to be a little bit larger and the little gaps in between these are going to be a little bit smaller. Um, maybe, you know, depending on who you are, they, they look a little better on your roof, um, if that's important to you. There's a third kind called amorphous, which is a sprayed-on technique. You know, these are your flexible fabrics, your very cheap solar panels. Um, recommend for anything you guys are, are thinking about doing, I would recommend just staying away from those. Um, when you're looking at modules, um, there's really not a whole lot that's different between different companies making modules. I'm going to be the one to say that. Um, a, a panel is a panel. What you're talking about are fractions of efficiency gains. And what you're paying for when you pay for a premium panel is a warranty. Um, you're also paying for the ability of that company to back up the warranty. This is probably one of the only things that I can really think of. I, can anybody else name an industry where, where you have to gamble on whether or not your warranty is going to be, uh, you know, worth anything in 20 years? Solar wind. Yeah. Wind. Yeah. Yeah. My wind thing went out of business. Is that right? Yeah. So a lot of times what, that, what that'll do is that'll spook people into buying a premium panel of a company that's been around since the 80s and then they've got that financial wherewithal to grant your warranty when it comes up. Um, so if that's important to you, then get a premium panel. If it's not important to you, then, you know, I would recommend going with one of these uh, bootstrap startups, you know, and, and getting a better price. Absolutely. You know, one other thing that you can actually look at is the physical quality of the frame. You know, I ordered these online, I didn't really have that, but they had really great reviews. So peer reviews, people that know solar, that's what I'm going to be looking to when I look for a module. We talked about power output, depending on a lot of factors. I think shade is the obvious one. Um, length of day is the obvious one. Dust, any of that stuff. Heat might not be something you're aware of, but the panels, they like to stay cool. If they're tucked up real close to your roof, then a lot of times you'll lose a little bit of um, power production on really hot summer days. You might intuitively think that summer is going to be your most power, but it's these really crisp spring and fall days where you'll probably get the most instantaneous power. Um, let's talk about ratings on these things. Um, I'm going to turn this around and I'll let at least one of you guys look at it. You guys see those little stickers on the back? That's what you want to look for when you start looking at buying a panel to suit a particular need. You want to look at these little stickers that are on all the manufacturer spec sheets. That sticker says, um, you want to read it out to me? What's our open circuit voltage? 20.5 volts. 20.5 volts? 22. 22. What's our uh, short circuit current? It's our voltage at power max. 18.9. Current? 5.29. 5.29? Mm. Okay. Those are your four numbers that you need to know when you're specking a panel. Um, voltage at max power. Current and max power, multiply those numbers and you've got your, your max power wattage of your panel. About 100. Yeah. Pretty close. <laughs> I, you know, I used to go to a school with a guy who it was really good at air math and he was a computer science guy. And he would say, you guys are familiar with undo command, control Z? 
he would be like five times, wait, no, control Z, wait. Huh? So, <laughs> that used to crack me up. Um, yeah, about 100 watts. Multiply these together, way over 100 watts. Open circuit, you guys know what an open circuit is? Open circuit's when you turn your light bulb off. Open circuit means there's no circuit. You're not powering anything. You've got your two leads to the solar panel and you can measure voltage at one or the other and you put this thing in maximum sunlight conditions and you're gonna read 22.5. That's the highest theoretical voltage of that one module. Short circuit is when you take those two leads and you plug them in together, you're getting a uh, theoretical 5.75 amps. So when you start looking at multiplying panels, like now that we have four panels, we're not talking about a 22 volt system anymore. Take that and multiply it by four. Because we have those wired in series, that means that we've got a, almost a 100 uh, volt array right here. Theoretical 100 volt array. Do you guys know what it means to wire things in series? Here's my four modules. In series, it's like the Christmas lights is the old example. You've got your string of Christmas lights and one of them goes out, the whole thing goes out. Those are wired in series. Because power starts at a point, goes in, does this, right? That's your circuit. When we do that, when we wire these in series, we're compounding the voltage. So 22.5, um, 22.5, 22.5, 22.5. Almost a 100 volt system, give it, you know, 95 volt. Say I wanted to wire those up in parallel, then that's the other configuration where you're going. Like this, right? A little hard to draw. <laughs> and there's your negative. Okay, that's a 22 volt system with almost uh, 24 amps of power, right? So when you're designing big systems, you can do things like put your modules in series parallel. You, you, most of the really big systems, you see, or most of the systems you see on anybody's house, say you've got 24 modules, most likely it's gonna be three rows of eight or something like that. And what you're doing is boosting the voltage for various reasons, and you're taking the amperage and you're trying to keep it within um, a range. Um, boosting the voltage, who knows why we have really high voltage transmission lines? Power lines. Small copper, small leads. Exactly. Um, so we don't have to have these, you know, humongous power lines. Really high voltage has less of a power loss in the line, right? If you have a really high amperage um, line, then you need a bigger wire in order to carry that amperage. Um, I know these are really esoteric concepts. I'm gonna use the old uh, water pipe analogy. Most of you guys, have, some of you guys have heard this, I'm sure. Voltage is the size of your pipe, right? Think of it that way. Amperage is the amount of water that's moving through your pipe, the rate of water moving through your pipe. That's why we call it electron flow. It literally is a flow. Um, you know, say you've got a one inch pipe and you want to send, I don't really know these numbers off the top of my head, 10 gallons a minute through a one inch pipe. You're going to be okay, right? If you want to send 100 gallons a minute through a one inch pipe, it's going to be screaming through there. There's going to be a lot of friction loss, really high velocity. It's the same in that wire. You need really big wires to handle the electron flow without having so much friction. Not that big of a deal in a water system, except loud, noisy racket, efficiency losses. Um, an electrical system, that's where your wires catch on fire. Really big deal. Um, if we get time, we can talk a lot about wire sizing at the end of this. If you go online and you buy a kit or anything, say, staying in the 400, 500 watt range, Wire size is not going to be that big of a deal for you um, because at least in the solar industries, you're going to run up against some minimums um, where they probably won't sell you a wire that's rated to go on a 
roof for anything less than number 10 wire. You know, um, there's a lot, again, in the back of your um, handouts on wire sizing. Um, anybody have any questions about series parallel? You got a question? Well, I guess your charge controller would depend on which choice you make there, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. So who knows what a charge controller does? I, I think it takes, uh, it takes a certain amount of uh, current to, to fill the panel. And then once the panel's filled, the excess goes through the uh, controller to the battery and keeps the battery from being overcharged. That's the key there. Yeah, it's and I think some of them even undercharged. Like you have that under voltage relay or something. Like if it if it, if it dropped too low or something like that. Well, no, I, I never mind. I apologize. Yeah, the battery drops too low, it'll like um, it'll cut off the loads of the battery, so you don't damage your batteries. Yeah. Yeah. Key there being number one reason why we're going to use a charge controller is to prevent overcharging the battery. We hook up a module directly to a battery. You know, that battery may be 50% capacity, and you leave it alone, it's going to boil that battery. It's going to overheat and uh, destroy the battery itself if it goes over a certain voltage. There are some very uh, sophisticated charge controllers out there. Ones that will look at the battery, the battery chemistry. You know, you've got to program it in there. You've got to tell it what kind of battery you got. And it's going to say, okay, the battery's at this uh, capacity, um, we want to give it everything we got. Okay, the battery's getting to 95% capacity, let's dial it down. And then let's float charge it, you know, once it gets up to 99% capacity. Um, and let's do that cycle all over again. Boost, float, boost, float. That's the kind that I have. This is a, a maximum power point tracking charge controller. So let's go back to these two numbers, maximum power is what the MP stands for. Voltage at max power, 18.9. Current at max power. Those numbers, as the sunlight radiance changes over time, those numbers are gonna change a little bit. And it's this constant game where like, the, for some reason the modules are gonna be putting out 18.5 volts. What the charge controller is gonna do is condition the power coming off the roof and find that maximum power point before charging the battery or running the load. Um, there's less sophisticated versions out there um, that only prevent battery overcharging. Um, I'm just gonna say up front that I would recommend the maximum power point tracking charge controller. And I would also recommend if you are thinking about it to maybe get one a little bit bigger than what you need today. Because that's the, the point where you say, that's a 12 or 24 volt maximum uh, power point tracking charge controller. Yeah, here you go, right on the front. Battery voltage, it can take up to 12 or 24 volts systems. Um, max solar power, 550 watts at 12 volts. So I did buy one that's just a little bit upsized um, because I wanted the option to do something later in the future. Actually started building this thing at just 300 watts and then we already upsized once. Um, max solar VOC, 100 volts. So what if I did want to put six modules on here instead of four? Um, well, I can't put six modules in series or I've gone over 100 volts. That's where I need to start playing with my series parallel in order to get my power in the right condition for this thing to accept it. It's also a 40 amp charge controller. Now, I'm only giving it five amps on a sunny day, you know, so I can do quite a bit in order to give a little bit more power to this, but it would probably be a little bit more complicated wiring scheme than what I have right now. Yeah, well, the advantage is instead of a, like a 40 watt charger versus say a 15 or something like that, would be that it's just gonna charge your battery bank much faster. So if you have a big battery bank, you can't get something undersized or it really won't ever charge your batteries while it's, while it's sunny. Yeah, yeah. So if I had a huge battery bank and my little small solar system with my little small charge controller, yeah, you could still charge it, but batteries don't like to stay undercharged for a really long time either. So you need to consider your battery size according to your, your um, 
charger size. Um, definitely consider that, but no, we need a charge controller that matches the amount of power that I have generating, and then we need a charge controller that can provide that power to the battery. So that's a 40 amp charge controller that's gonna charge that battery maximum at 40 amps. It's maximum is 100 volts going in, it's maximum is 40 amps going in, right? So you need to look at the input and the output characteristics of the charge controller. Most importantly, the input. What's that? Were you saying that you could put some of those in parallel and some in series in the same setup? I could, yeah. Like for instance, I could have um, two in, in series and two, in, in two banks in parallel. I could do that. In solar, they call that uh, strings. When you start, hey, you have a string of modules in series and then you have three strings of those modules, or two strings. Yeah, let's pretend we wanted to do that in series parallel. Um, <laughs> sorry for my drawing there. Series, positive out, negative out. Series, positive out, negative out. So, these positives are gonna get bussed together somehow, and these negatives are gonna get bussed together somehow before going to the charge controller. There's an extra step there when you wanna start looking at parallel wiring. Um, they call that a combiner box. We don't have a combiner box, um, but if you wanted to, you could do that. In which case, um, usually each one of these strings is gonna have its own fuse. Um, before getting combined into a much larger wire that can handle the larger amperage that we've created now. Right? So you were said something about the, the charge controller you've got is either 12 or 24 volts DC, so that's the output somewhere. It's got terminals for either? Uh, something like that? It's looking at the battery. For the same reasons, we can do a series parallel configuration on a battery. Um, we either want to increase the capacity of the battery or we want to increase the voltage. A lot of really big off-grid systems are going to be running as high as 48 volts. Um, again, that's to keep your wire sizes down. Yeah? I think it's important to tell the group that the voltage and amperage coming from the panel is completely independent from the voltage and amperage going to the battery. They're two separate systems. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so the voltage that we've talked about so far is the panel voltage. Yeah. The batteries will dictate what voltage the batteries want to be charged at whatever state they are. Everybody get that? That's what your charge controller is doing. It's conditioning the, the electricity from the roof and it's making it the kind of electricity that your batteries want, right? So when I say that could be a 24 volt battery, um, I could either go out and buy a 24 volt battery or I could buy two 12 volt batteries and I could wire them in series and now I've got a 24 volt battery. Um, in this case, I've got two 6 volt batteries that I wired in series. Um, so I've got a 12 volt system with high, you know, 220 amp hour capacity. That's high for us. Um, like I said, again, the really big off grid systems are 48 volts or sometimes even bigger up into 60. Um, that's so that they can keep those wire sizes down. When you start talking about a 12 volt wire that's gonna feed your entire house uh, electricity, you're starting to talk about some pretty fat wires. Um, cost goes way up when you start buying that much copper. Um, I think for our purposes, I think most of us are probably looking at one to 400 watts, something in the range that we're making and um, I'm making assumptions here that you guys are all interested in doing the same kind of stuff that I am. Um, you're probably going to be okay with a 12 volt system. 12 volt loads are really common. Um, you know, your RVs, they're going to be 12 or 24 volt systems. You can go on these RV supply house sites and get fun little 12 volt boxes. Is that right, Joe? What was the cost of the, uh, of the controller? Remember? Did they break it up? It's about $200. You know, again, we said that was about thirteen or fourteen hundred dollars. Six hundred and fifty is just in the batteries alone. I got the Primo, basically the nicest batteries that we could budget for. Um, 
for a handful of reasons. Um, freeze tolerant batteries, um, vibration tolerant batteries. It's on a trailer going down the road, going out to the pasture. They're also, I said earlier that they can take a quick discharge and a quick charge, a little bit better than your common lead acid battery can. That's important when you start looking at um, discharging a battery too quickly, you lose a lot of efficiencies there. Um, so is that a gel mat so you don't have to add water or stuff is. like that? Entirely maintenance free too. Let's pretend we don't have a battery at all. Um, here's our big solar panel and here's a pump. That's how I draw pumps. Um, that's a 12 volt pump and we're going to plug it directly in. Remember this thing puts out up to 18 volts, right? So it's going to maybe overpower that pump a little bit um, on a really hot sunny day. Of course, when a cloud goes by, that pump is going to just, you know, going to just die down completely. There's a really cool video of one of my old friends that uh, had a 12 volt uh, record player and he just plugged it in directly to a solar panel and tried to listen to it and it's just the music is just yeah it's all over the place it's really fun um, <laughs> but let's say we wanted to skip the battery and um, we only wanted to run the pump when the sun is out that's totally possible and um, what I would recommend you know is the old-fashioned water tower and this is a system that I'm just dying to get in here, um, kind of really similar to why we got that windmill out there. But let's say we wanted to do that on solar instead. We've got a cistern at the top of the hill. We're only pumping solar when the, or only pumping when the sun's out. And we're pumping into the cistern, and we're just going to gravity feed out of the cistern to do irrigation. That's an easy system that works really well on the farm. Um, one thing that might happen, because your motor is getting variable power all throughout the day is you're probably going to see prematurely failure on that pump. One thing that you can do, and a lot of these, there are a lot of systems available like this, um, is that you have some sort of controller in the middle. It's not a charge controller. In this case, they call it an LCB, linear current booster. And it does basically the same thing that a charge controller is doing except it's just going to shut off when there's not enough power anymore. But it is going to condition the, pan the solar energy, volts and amps, to be more in line with what your pump wants. A lot of these will go a step further, and they'll include a little float switch up in your cistern or your water tower. And it'll say, OK, when the water tower is full, just stop pumping altogether, right? Those are quick and easy some, you know, systems. If all you want to do is irrigate, then that may be the best route for you. Um, so long as you've got some gradient on your hill and you want to build a, a, you know, a water tower. Um, I just wanted to show that as a means to get away from doing the batteries and driving up the cost. I mean, that's half the cost on that system is just in batteries. That would no doubt be what we would use if we wanted to just power these greenhouse fans directly, we would look at some sort of linear current booster. We've got uh, backup fans in this greenhouse for when the power cuts off. We can run them directly off of batteries as well. You guys notice our greenhouses actually have to stay inflated, especially in the winter time. If you want to do any other kind of storage, you know, there's fun ways to do storage. You can do this compressed air thing. Um, I've read about that, although I haven't ever actually seen that in practice. Compressed air is a, you know, you just run an air compressor when the sun's out. Um, Richard, have you ever seen those? Yeah, we, we used it for a shop yeah. some, some years ago. But uh, it's, um, it's also a safety feature. There's no electrical shock. You know, people can stand in the water and use the tools, uh, uh, you know, using air tools instead of electrical tools. So that's the other component. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have to tailor the, uh, the tools to the, the medium. Yeah. You know, so that's one way to do it if you want to get away from using batteries. Again, you're going to need something to keep your air compressor from prematurely dying as well. 
say you don't want to do a water tower, you want to do something else. We've already shown that you can do series parallel on batteries. Um, just to show you again, we've got two six volt batteries right here, 220 amp hours each. So when I wire those together in series, I've got 12 volts, 220 amp hours, right? Well, what happens if I like, and I'll tell you, somebody did this. They took my little inverter and they plugged it up uh, here and here. Because that battery is still marked red right here. You know, I know, you know, you guys jump your car and you just match the colors, red to black. Well, if you do that here, you know, then you're tapping off a six volt battery right here. You know, you need to come over here to this positive and that negative in order to get your 12 volts. Outside of um, series parallel, you know, one thing, again, I was looking for some high quality batteries, AGM batteries. You guys know what other kinds of batteries there are? Traditional vented lead acid batteries. It's what most of us have in our cars. Um, a vented lead acid battery um, is a fine choice for an off-grid system. Um, as so long as you get a deep cycle battery. Everybody know what that means? Deep cycle means that um, it can tolerate a deeper discharge than a traditional like automotive battery. Right? A really easy amateur mistake would be to buy a bunch of really cheap automotive batteries and thinking that you're getting the one up on the solar industry. And um, you're going to experience some premature failures by doing that. The batteries are going to no longer be able to hold a charge if you cycle them down too deep too many times in a row. Right? So what I have are deep cycle batteries that can tolerate going down to say 30% or maybe as low as 20%. You don't really ever want to go below 20 or 30. Um, you'll see charts when you start looking to buy batteries. You're going to see, uh, you know, if you go to the right manufacturer, they're going to have this information available for you. It's going to say, you can discharge this to 50% this many times. You can discharge this to 30% this many times. And you'll see that 50% um, is kind of your sweet spot. You don't really want to go much lower than that too many times. Right? So when you start saying, oh, I've got 220 amp hours, I can run my one amp load for 220 hours. Not really. I can actually only do it for about 110. Right? So that's your first major hit on your batteries. Um, Certain batteries are going to be more tolerant to deep discharge than others. Um, you, you're generally just paying for lead at that point. Um, your automotive battery is going to have a lot of really thin lead, pla uh, lead plates inside an acid solution, right? And that surface area gives you a huge starting current, what you need to start your car. It gives you the ability to just provide a ton of amps for a very short amount of time without discharging the battery so much, right? So when you start your car, you're probably discharging your battery to like, I don't know this for a fact, but I want to, it's very low, like 2% discharge on that battery or something. That's why you can sit there and crank your car forever um, before you completely kill your battery. Um, deep cycle batteries or big heavy plates. And when you're paying for a deep cycle battery, that's what you're paying for, is that extra lead. Every time they cycle down and power back up and cycle power back down, they lose a little bit of lead off the side of those plates. So when you get a true deep cycle battery, you're getting the biggest plate you can. Um, the only way that you're going to know that is by reading the manufacturer's specs, customer reviews, that kind of thing. Actually looking at their data, saying, okay, you can discharge it this many times. Um, and, um, you know, checking that warranty, you know, to make sure that it's in line. Um, these Lifeline batteries are made by Concord. They're a really reputable company. 
Trojan Batteries, a real reputable company. Um, Rolls, Surrett. Forklift batteries are generally a pretty good choice. Um, they're stream deep cycle batteries. You know, if you've got a line on some used forklift batteries, that might be a good way to go. There's a lot of other different kinds of batteries out there. Um, a lot of new technology coming out. Um, very promising technology. But for all purposes, you guys doing your small standalone systems are going to be looking at lead acid batteries and uh, Mix and match batteries? No. No, you really can't. Batteries is one of those things that you kind of want to buy um, all your batteries at once. Um, you know, and as I know I said earlier that it's modular. You can do that with your solar. Your batteries not so much. You know, when one battery starts to wear down, it, it has a tendency to draw down the rest of the batteries. Um, you can hobble along, I think, by replacing individual cells or individual batteries. But ultimately, for the health of your system, you're better off just buying a new bank. Yeah. The two for 300 bucks over, and, and then uh, RV batteries. Yeah. Together. Am I doing myself any good or doing myself worse as far as? Are they the same chemistry, the battery, do you know? Uh, I'm thinking the two wheelchair batteries are probably the AGMs, and then the other one is the lead acid. Yeah, it's possible you're doing some premature failure on those. Yeah. When I say, you know, it's not even just the chemistry, but it's getting a battery, basically putting it in use at the same time as the rest of the bank. You know, I, I can't really tell you any stories about that not working out for anybody. Um, but um, I'm sure they're out there. Did everybody hear that? So golf cart battery used to be popular too, is that it? Yeah, they're fine choice. They're fine choice. There's different um, like amp hour ratings for different lengths of like discharging the battery, and that's like like the C10, C20, C100. Um, so C100 means uh, you're discharging that battery over 100 hours, whereas C10 means you're discharging it over 10 hours. Um, and so when you're shopping for batteries, make sure. You're, you're comparing like the C10 amp hourage of that battery to the C10 amp hourage of the other battery that you're comparing. Everybody get that? C10 capacity over 10 hours. Yeah, I'm pretty sure too, if when we're looking at the golf cart batteries, they're rated just a little different because of how they're typically used than like a typical deep cell, which is usually you think of in terms of on a boat with a trolling motor. I think they're rated like at 20 amps, amp hours, or tw you know, in 20s. Yeah. And I think the golf cart batteries, if I'm not mistaken, are rated in 50 amp yeah. calculations. So that makes a huge difference on the capacity. That's why, you know, I think the, the, the gold standard had been, you know, on 12 volt systems, or even 24 and 36, is to get uh, the, the, the six volt batteries and then wire them to get the, the voltage that you want so that you have the best capacity. Yeah, yeah, so most manufacturers, and you, when you're talking shopping for solar deep cycle batteries, they're probably gonna give you the C20 rate. Um, that's a pretty, uh, I wanna say that's the standard. Now if there's some shy C manufacturer may give you the C100 rate, you know, and say, oh, I've got the biggest battery at C100 in fine print. Um, but Johnny's right, that's not comparing apples to apples. Um, and of course, they're gonna put the biggest number that they can on the side of the box, you know, cause that's what most consumers are blindly gonna be going after. Um, so yeah, absolutely right, Johnny, especially when you're looking at your traditional uh, lead acid battery. Um, the AGMs, not so much. You know, those, like I said earlier, those can actually tolerate a quicker discharge and a quicker charge. Let's go back to that block heater idea. Remember that? We had 83 amps and a 220 watt or 220 amp hour battery. That would be a C3 rate. That's like red alarm. That's, that's too fast for most systems. It would work for mine and the AGM batteries. Uh, again, it's probably not something I want to do too many times, but it'll definitely work. Um, uh, C5 is normally your too fast discharge rate. 
Right. So that would be the top end. So you, well, you all, everybody understand the C5 thing? When expressed on paper, it's going to look like that. So I've got a C5. Um, I might have a 180 amp hour battery. But at C20, it's a 220 amp hour battery. You know, at C100, I'm making these numbers up, by the way. <laughs> at C100, it might be a 230 amp hour battery. It's not that much more, but it would be a little bit more. It's also dependent on temperature. Really um, hot batteries are going to discharge faster, and they're not going to hold their charge quite as well. Cold batteries might not provide enough power, but they'll hold their power a lot longer. I heard about these guys who race electric, uh, electric cars. And uh, one thing they do is take their battery banks and they like boil them in a water bath just to get them very, very, very hot because all they care about is that starting time. You know, so they're gonna provide the most amount of power real quickly if they're really hot. But obviously they don't really do their function as batteries at that point anymore, they're running out. That also goes for storage. Too. So long-term storage of batteries, you want to keep them at a reasonable temperature. You know, we're talking room temp here. Cold, not such a big deal um, as long as you're staying above freezing. Um, these batteries can tolerate a little less than freezing for a short amount of time. Um, but I'll tell you what, we keep this thing in this room while we're working on it. And this room's actually about 100 degrees every day um, when we're not running fans and we're actually trying to dry things in here. Um, big no-no. We really should be locking that up and keeping it somewhere on the farm uh, at a more comfortable 70 or 80 degrees. Um, and no doubt, as soon as we're done playing with it, it'll go somewhere else. So is there a state of charge meter or are you really, uh, you really have to know your load and how long you have it on? Is that kind of the... Yeah, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, my charge controller has a state of charge meter. And it's... Um, questionable how accurate it is, but it's pretty close. And I'll tell you how it's measuring state of charge or how it's reading that is just looking at the voltage on the battery itself. You guys know that a 12 volt battery is just, they call that nominal voltage. It's not really 12 volts. I mean, it might be at one point, but a fully charged 12 volt battery, I believe is what, 13.6? Yeah. So that battery is I'll show you on the controller right now because I'm pretty sure it's at 100%. Well, 13.2 right now. So I can click through my little settings and I can come across a, uh, yeah, there's my 100% fully charged um, sign. Now all that's doing is just looking at the battery voltage and telling you that. Now there's certain things that you can do to um, kind of trick your, um, controller into thinking that it's more charged than it actually is. One of those is never actually fully recharging it. If it stays in this state of not fully charged, then it can actually um, believe that it would never actually re-fully charge again. Um, another thing is just repetitive over discharging. You know, it may still actually read 13.6 volts, but it's not still going to have that 220 amp hours that you began with because it'll start to wear out those plates, as I was showing you. Um, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. I'm not familiar with battery tenders because I don't have one. But is a battery tender worth putting on something like this? This, um, no. Like for nighttime or something, you know what I'm saying? No, the battery tender is the, oh, the little wall plug-in yeah. thing. No, not necessary. Totally not necessary. Yeah. Um, no, that charge controller is a battery tender. It's doing the same thing. When it does a float charge, that's exactly what it's doing. Let's go back to that 12 volt, 5 amp pump that I want to run. That 240 watt hours. Okay, um, that's a 5 amp system that I want to run. Four hours a day. So I need 20 amp hours. 
a day to run it. Assuming that I'm not putting anything else back into it, I need a battery that's 20 amp hours to run it for one day. That battery needs to be 40 amp hours if I don't want to kill it prematurely. If I want to discharge it to 50%, I need a 40 amp hour battery. Say I want to run it for three days without sun, that's pretty typical when you're designing off-grid systems, is to say I want three days of autonomy. Now I need a 120 amp hour battery just to run that pump for three eight hour days, or three four hour days, sorry. Um, which is half the size of that. That's a $300 battery, you know, for a 12 volt, 120 amp hour battery. Um, again, generally when you're doing this and you know that you need something on demand, that three days of autonomy is a pretty good point. Um, you know, most off-grid homes are going to be looking at three days of autonomy. Outside of that, you're going to need some sort of outside power generation source. That's because rarely do you go three days without any sunlight at all. Um, you know, what we want is a system that can recharge that in a day, you know, um, or at least be able to run our 40 watt or 60 watt load in a day. If we want to run it instantaneous, we need at least a 60 watt module. But what we really need is something quite a bit bigger because for the same reason that battery is rated 220 amp hours, you know, that module is rated 100 watts at power max. Power max is not happening in Asheville, North Carolina very often. Most of the time you're going to get, you know, there's a lot of humidity, a lot of issues, clouds, all that. Um, best rule of thumb is maybe upsize that by about 20% if you want to count on running something when the sun's out. So let's call that an 80 watt module. It's what we need to run our 60 watt pump. Eighty watts over six hours. Remember I said that six hour window, nine to three, is gonna be um six times eight. Four hundred and eighty watt hours a day. So that's almost I mean that's twice what you actually need to run that pump four hours a day. Again, that's your best conditions. I'll tell you, when I started looking at 80 watt modules when I was prepping this example, um, 80 watt modules are about the same price as a 100 watt module. So you might as well go ahead and get a 100 watt module for 100 bucks. And then, you know, have a little bit more play there. Say we got a 100 watt module. Then we need to look at the, you know, say we bought one of these. We're going back and we're looking at that open circuit voltage and we're looking at that short circuit current and we're going to size our charge controller accordingly. So one of the smallest charge controllers I could find was a 10 amp charge controller at 12 volts. So that's good for one of these, you know, 12 volt nominal. Um, what I would do instead is probably pay the extra 20 bucks and get a 20 amp charge controller instead. Because when you start looking at really smart small charge controllers. They're going to be about the same price. Everybody look on the last page of this handout. Yeah. You mentioned a couple of times, well actually once in here, it says in some cases the charge controller, you could, you could pull the DC load off of that, which I guess means you wouldn't have, you wouldn't need batteries in that case. And what circumstance might you use that way? Well, remember my pumping system that I was explaining? So pumping where you use the cistern as storage? Okay, so use that yeah. instead of the LBC or whatever you said. Yeah, you could do that. You could, you know, this thing actually, I don't believe it'll even run without a battery though. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it needs that constant buffer there. So we were talking about this 240 watt hour load. You guys all see that on the last page. I'm gonna show you some actual components that I spec'd out. This module would be a hundred bucks if you wanted a hundred watt module. You could get a premium one for 150 or 200 bucks if you really wanted to. Um, you need that 120 amp hour battery for three days of autonomy. Um, yeah, I found one for about 150 bucks. A good deep cycle battery. Um, you could do that 10 amp 
maximum power point charge controller. Remember I said you don't really want to do, in my opinion, I wouldn't do anything less than a maximum power point charge controller. You know, they have other ones called PWM. For the most part, just stay away from that. Um, again, I would upsize that for future expansion, get a nice one for 100 or so bucks, 150 bucks. And then um, you're gonna add a, a, some fuses and we can look at the fuses on this array. That stuff's gonna add up. Um, you can do this pump for four hours a day for three days for about 500 bucks. And that's if you want batteries and a module and everything. And if you want to get nicer, you can spend more money, certainly. Um, I would opt for the $750 in case I wanted to run two pumps. That would be pretty easy, easy deal to do. What if you wanted to run that pump 24 hours a day? What are your design? More batteries and you have to have enough panels to charge those batteries in that six hours? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're definitely, absolutely going to need a much bigger battery bank. Um, and then you're going to plan on, uh, you know, cutting that off if the sun's not shining. Now, during, when this is charging and it's set up, during the day at max sunlight, it's all just charging the battery and that draws from the battery or is there a setup where that can take the load from the panels without discharging the battery? Some of this is going directly to the battery. Some of it's actually going out to control loads. Mainly just the controls. Remember we've got that uh, uh, tracking device, our windshield wiper motor? Yeah. That's powered directly off the panels. Okay. Yeah. Because it's all the turns during the day. It's yeah. yeah, so when we get into that, what that actually means is that that charge controller will, will not provide power to anything that's coming off the charge controller if the battery gets low enough. What it won't do is shut off any loads that are coming directly off the battery, right? It doesn't have any control over anything on that side. So my inverter, which converts DC to AC power, my inverter is plugged in directly to the batteries. So if I plug a light in and forget about it, then yeah, that battery's gonna overcharge, over discharge. Um, same with any of my DC loads that connect directly on the battery. Um, what I have in, to compensate for that problem is this little device here on the side. You, you can't see that, I'm sure, but it's just a little electronic module, uh, DC 12 volt rated 30 amp, um, capacity low voltage disconnect. So it's reading the voltage on my batteries and any 30 amp DC load that I want to run off of that, I'm going to plug into that low voltage disconnect. So that's just my safety feature. I've got a program to cut it off if that battery goes to 50% or less. So yeah. this uh, 450 to 750 doesn't include your trailer and uh, all that kind of stuff, that's extra. No, but it includes some basic mounting hardware. I think I accommodated something like, yeah, 20 to 50 bucks to bolt it onto something. You know, U-bolts on a fence post or something's a really popular way to do it. Um, you know, a wooden frame, it's, it's totally fine to mount at whatever angle you want. Um, again, I got a lot of resources Apologies for the really quick pace here. Any other questions before we wrap up this part? Good. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it.